the portals of enlightenment have opened and your journey of mind, body, and spirit has begun. Welcome to Portals to Enlightenment. And now your host, psychic medium and traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and medical Qigong, radio show personality, as well as member of the Asian American Journalist and Media Association, Psychic Medium Sherry. Hi everybody, welcome back to Portals, <laughs> Portals to Enlightenment, the journey of body, mind, and spirit. And I just want to go and, and uh, introduce a, a new guest. And he's a special guest. He's been on our radio show, Paranormal Horizons. And we're, we're going to introduce David Weatherly. Uh, many of you probably don't know David Weatherly, but he is a paranormal researcher. He's a ecologist. Uh, he is, uh, he work, has, has written many books. And I'm very, very uh, pleased to welcome David Weatherly. Hey, David, come on in. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. So we're going to talk about this time. We're going to talk about probably either we're going to run the gamut. We're going to talk about the cryptoids, your your new book, or Black Eyed Children, and we'll just roll with it. Whatever you want to go with, that's right. Okay, great. So let's talk about the first thing I'm thinking is is Black Eyed Children. What are black Black Eyed Children, by the way? It's a phenomenon that uh, has really caught a lot of people's attention in the last several years. Uh, they are essentially these strange kids that are showing up. They're showing up at people's homes, places of businesses. Uh, they're showing up at hotels. There's a wide range of places these things manifest. And they have the form of a young child, usually between the ages of about nine and early teens. And they appear mostly human. Uh, except for their eyes. Their eyes are always completely black, solid black eyes. No no whites in the eyes. The entire sclera is black. Uh, their skin is usually described as being very pale. And they try to gain injury. So, you know, we get these creepy situations. Uh, a great example is actually the most famous case uh, involved a man named Brian Bethel. And uh, Brian was living in Texas at the time still lives there, but he went out one evening to pay a bill, just wanted to write a check and drop it in an after-hours payment slot. So he rode down to a strip center, he's sitting in his vehicle, writing the check out, and these two young boys approached his car. Now, Bethel wasn't in a bad neighborhood, there wasn't anything outwardly that he should have been frightened of, but he said that initially he just felt very uneasy. So... He only rolled his window down just a little bit to find out what these kids wanted. When they began speaking to him, he began, began to become more and more uneasy and, and outright nervous. They were asking him questions. They, they wanted a ride. And they said, uh, Mr., we need a ride home. We forgot our money. And he said, I say it like that because he said they would put strange emphasis on certain words. So, as the encounter unfolded, these children were claiming that they forgot their money and they wanted to see a movie. Well, Bethel had the presence of mind to glance over the movie marquee and realize that the film that they were talking about was more than half over. So, it didn't make any sense to rush home and get your money for, you know, less than half of a showing of, uh, of the last movie. So... His reluctance uh, was noticed by these children, and they got a bit more cushy. And they were saying things like, we're just a couple of kids. We can't get in unless you invite us in. Uh, just just let us in the car. They got very insistent. And as they began to do this, Brian took a closer look. And when he made eye contact with the child that was closest to his driver's window, he realized this boy had solid black eyes. That caused the flight response to kick in for Bethel, and he had enough, he threw the car into here, he backed out of the space, he turned to leave, as he glanced in his rearview mirror, he found that these kids had vanished. Now, this was 1997, kind of the early days of the internet, Bethel went and, and you know, he was trying to process this experience, and trying to understand why he was so disturbed, why he was so shaken up from encountering a couple kids. He ended up posting his 
encounter online in an early uh, forum. And there was an outpouring of responses. Uh, people were fascinated by this account. Some of them had questions. Uh, a lot of them wanted you know, more details. And then there were other people saying, oh my God, I've seen something like this. This Something similar happened to me in, in Oregon and California, all these different places. Bethel was so inundated, in fact, with people reaching out to him about this encounter. He ended up at one point just retreating entirely from any kind of online, open online presence. He wouldn't answer emails. He wouldn't do anything. In fact, it's curious because when I wrote the book, the first edition of this book came out in uh, 2012. And it was re-released in 2017, uh, a revised edition. One of the reasons I re-released it was uh, I just wanted to fine-tune it a little bit, but I added an entirely new chapter uh, that was a direct conversation with Brian, reflecting on his encounter because it had been 20 years. 20 years later, this man is still infected, affected by this encounter. And he still doesn't really understand what happened. He has a lot of questions. Uh, but this is typical for people who have these experiences. Uh, they meet these kids, and, you know, I, I can sit here and tell you this, this story, and it sounds like, okay, I'm sure there's some listener going, no big deal, a couple of kids with dark eyes. But what I have to emphasize is that the people who encounter these kids, there's so much more than just this brief visual. The visual is creepy. You know, let's, there's no two ways about it. Uh, but there's something else that affects these people on a much deeper level. And when you sit and talk to people who've had these experiences, it's, it's like speaking to a trauma victim because they are so affected by this experience. And hands down, almost every person that encounters these kids, they go through these stages, initial unease, which goes to uh, nervousness, which goes into this flight response. And it, it's, it's not a fight or flight response, it's just a flight response. They feel like they just have to get away from these kids because they don't know what will happen if they don't. Wow. Now, do you feel that these things are, are multidimensional? Are these hybrids? What's your feeling on this, Dave, with all these different accounts? You know, when I wrote the book, I didn't want to, uh, I, I didn't write it with the idea of putting my personal opinion out there on it, because one of the things that's fascinating about this phenomenon is that you can look at it and say, okay, these are something demonic, because it fits a lot of those parameters. Uh, you can also look at it and say, well, it also fits the parameters of, of a so-called alien-human hybrid. Uh, and then there's a, oh gosh, you know, at least a half dozen or more different things that it falls into because they share things in common with the men in black, for instance. Uh, there are experiences that people have reported to me that these things sound more like a, a, a ghost or a spirit. So it's it's quite fascinating to look at these encounters and put them into different boxes, so to speak, and say, okay, well, we can use this set of encounters and say, yeah, it sounds like an alien hybrid. And then we can look at these other encounters and say, no, this sounds like something demonic. So it really does run the gamut and cross a lot of the lines within the, the whole supernatural realm, which, like I said, is one of the things that fascinated me about the phenomenon when I started exploring it. Uh, over time, you know, my personal opinion is that I, I think there's something interdimensional. And uh, I, I, I come to that conclusion both from, from my personal investigations and my background. You know, my background is uh, shamanism. I trained with a lot of Native people from around the world. And there are just things within that that have given me this perspective that, no, these are something that are slipping in from a different level of reality. Wow, that's crazy. Is there, are these people, do you think that are of sound mind, are they taking drugs, or, you know, I mean, just, are, are, is it just so, are they random people all over the world, or certain times, certain day, that kind of thing? Well, you know, as an investigator, one of the things you always look for is patterns. And, uh, again, this is something that really kind of fascinated and puzzled me a little bit when I started looking into these experiences, because, uh, of course, you know, I have a whole long uh, series of questions and things I ask people when they start telling me about these, these encounters. And initially, 
when I started collecting the accounts. Uh, I thought, as a lot of people probably would, I thought, you know what, I bet there's a correlation with UFO sightings or, or with some other type of phenomenon. But there's not, not really. A very small number. So then, you know, I also look for uh, commonalities amongst the uh, victims who experience these things. And initially, wasn't really much of a, a commonality there. We're talking about a wide range of ages, of ethnic backgrounds, of religious belief, uh, and everything else. One thing that did emerge over time is that there are an unusual number of people who report these experiences who work in some kind of a position of authority. Uh, law enforcement, military personnel, uh, political employees, uh, government employees, and uh, doctors. So, you know, that's pretty fascinating, and that's interesting for a couple of reasons. One is that a uh, portion of those people are trained observers, you know, military men and, and law enforcement. A lot of times their lives depend on being observant and looking at details. So, you know, they tend to be much more accurate in their descriptions of encounters. Uh, the other thing, of course, is you, you have to consider well, these are all jobs that have a certain amount of high pressure. And uh, to answer your initial question, no, I, I haven't encountered anyone that reported this to me that, uh, you know, reported there were alcohol, drugs, or anything like that involved. And I really don't think that that's the case. Are there children? Are, are you just children? Are there also uh, they call black-eyed adults? Is there any been reports on that? There are. You know, when I when I researched the initial book, I only looked at that briefly because there was a small number of accounts of black-eyed adults. And you know, over time, even even in modern times, I think there are a percentage of those that you can say, okay, this is very possible a hoax or a prank or something like that. But What's fascinating is that, you know, the Bethel's encounter was 1997. I really set out to find accounts that predated his, uh, his report. And I also wanted accounts that predated the Internet and preferably television, which I ended up finding. So if we look at a whole series of accounts over a long period of time, and these are some kind of beings or entities that are living here on the planet with us, then yeah, they probably would age. I bring that up because in recent years, there have been increasing numbers of reports of black-eyed adults. So, you know, even if we go back to the point of Bethel, uh, Bethel's report, that's over 20 years ago now. So these kids maybe are aging and are still possibly out there among us. I wonder where they hide out. I mean, they appear. Do they? I mean, it's just all of a sudden people, they see them. What are they going to do? <laughs> you know, the encounter. But you know, but you know they disappear very quickly, too. Uh, there, there's, an account, there's an account in the book from a law enforcement officer. And it's one of the most compelling to me because this, uh, this gentleman, he was working the night shift. He was out on a call about a domestic dispute. So he had gone to the location. No arrest was made. He was sitting in his patrol car writing out a report. And as he's sitting there, of course, you know, he, he's taking notes, but he's also occasionally glancing up in the neighborhood around him, even though it's a dead night, you know, it's completely quiet. And um, I don't recall the exact time it's in the book. I think it was something, you know, 2, 2, 3 a.m., somewhere in that range. And he happens to glance up at one point in the house next door to the one that he had been called to. Uh, has a raised deck on the front and at the front door, in front of the front door, he sees two kids. And, of course, he's going to get out and check this out because, you know, three of them, a couple of young kids should not be out. So, he gets out of the patrol car, he goes up and he goes up the steps and he starts to talk to these kids and he says, uh, He's, you know, asking them questions, why, why are you kids out here this time of night, you know, is something wrong? He's first thinking, okay, well, maybe it was so loud next door that it got them up for some reason, or you know, maybe something else is going on. But they're not really answering his questions, and, and at one point, uh, they say, they won't let us in. So, he's looking at these kids, and he's thinking, good gosh, these kids are really pale. 
there's something wrong with her eyes because her eyes are so dark. And now he's worried that he's in front of some kind of uh, abuse situation or, you know, or something else that's going on. So he took it to the bottom of it. He starts pounding on the front door and uh, calling out, you know, that it's law enforcement and he to open up. And it, it takes him a couple of times to rouse the person inside. Now, <laughs> in the course of this, he's, glanced, he's turned around to glance back at these kids and they have vanished. Now, you have to bear in mind, this is a raised deck, and he's climbed a set of steps to get to the front door. These kids are standing just behind him on the deck. There's only one way up and down, and it's by the steps. Well, he had locked that when he opened the sewing door to knock on the door. So these kids couldn't have slipped by him. They must have jumped over the rail. So now he's, he's looking over the railing. There's, there's not really anywhere to hide. He's scanning the whole area. You know, he's looking at his light. He's trying to find where these kids have gone and how they could have jumped off this high deck and then vanished somewhere. So when the person turns up at the door, it, it ends up being an elderly woman who has no idea what this gentleman is talking about. And she's saying, I don't have any kids of that age. And, and, you know, I don't even have any grandkids. Or there's, there's no kids in this home. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> it's an elderly retired woman. So... Now, of course, he's completely mystified, and he does a thorough search. He looks all around the area. He was so puzzled by this, uh, this whole incident that uh, for the longest time, he would go back on occasion to the neighborhood around the same time and you know, just, to see, just to see if by chance he could catch a glimpse of those two kids and, and get to the bottom of what he had experienced. But he was, he was never able to find them again, and there's no logical way that they could have gotten off of that porch, especially completely silently. Uh, so this is one of those fascinating things that when I say, you know, here we've got a law enforcement officer doing his job, highly observant, and he experienced something that he just can't explain. And he's probably thinking he's going crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what did I say? All right. right. <laughs> So what happens is, what happens if a person, if, and not that I'm really pray to God that we don't have to those, we have those encounters, but what is the thing that is uh, suggested that if we do encounter, what, do you, what is uh, the, the uh, pro, uh, not protocol, but what would be suggested what to do, not to bring them, not to talk to them, slam the door? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that recurs is, People who have these encounters consistently worry about these kids returning. Now, it doesn't really happen because all, almost all of the encounters, and there, there's one or two exceptions, but uh, for the most part, people only experience these things once, it seems. However, something that's very interesting, and this is another commonality amongst the experiencers, uh, a good portion of people who encounter these kids in the aftermath, they turn towards a religious tradition. Now, sometimes they go back to whatever they practice that more. Sometimes they they take something new, but they consistently tell me uh, that they just want something that they feel like will give them extra protection. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's so unusual, I think, that people, where do you get an answer for something like this? You know, there are no solid answers necessarily, so they're looking to, uh, to find a spiritual foundation because this is so off the charts for most of these people that they think, okay, well, <laughs> you know, this is something otherworldly or unexplainable, so I need something that's more divine and protective on my side. I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people tend towards spirituality in the aftermath. And, uh, you know, they talk about it, it has to them again, of course, that they're going to continue to pray and spiritual protection. So has there been any sickness or any type of uh, uh, curses or pains afterwards besides just the trauma? You know, there's a whole range of those things. It seems that the closer the proximity of these kids, the more likely there is for something to occur 
physically in the person's life. And, uh, you know, that kind of goes to another direction, too. There's a whole chapter in the book that talks about the potential of these kids as children. And that came up because there are cases uh, wherein people experience these children in the aftermath of the encounter, uh, terrible things happen in their life. So, you know, one gentleman, uh, a couple different people, they lost relatives not long after the encounter. Uh, there were other people, there was actually a woman who reached out and touched one of these children. And oh, really? uh, she reported that the, the, the child felt uh, deathly, that the skin was so cold and so clammy that it was unnatural. And in the aftermath of her encounter, there's a couple of people that have done that. Uh, in the aftermath of those encounters, these people have become physically ill uh, for a time. They, they've had a strain of misfortune that occurred to them. Uh, you know, when we're talking about loss of relationships, loss of jobs, uh, you know, car accidents, there's a whole range of things. So, I guess part of the dilemma of trying to just decipher exactly what these kids are, we, we just don't know, quite honestly. And there are so many arguments that sound compelling, and every time you think, okay, well, surely there has to be something demonic. You know, in the case of Proverbs, uh, this place around them, so even though they still stay within the same kind of basic form in terms of the encounters, that there are... Uh, you know, are there are usually two? You said there are two, or there can be a bunch of them. Let's see, there it is. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of the encounters where there's only one uh, solitary child. Okay. Uh, sometimes there are two on occasion. We'll hear about there being more. You know, occasionally there'll be three. And on a couple of occasions there have been, you know, people have said that we've been more than four or five. But uh, in general, most of the encounters involve either one or two children. Personal, uh, one of the ones I think is creepy hands down uh, involves just a single Okay. Well, so let's change the subject a little bit. Uh, you have a new book coming out, David. I have one that just came out on uh, January 1st, actually. It's called Silver State Monsters. The, uh, the book is about the cryptids of Nevada. And I, I had a blast writing that. You know, I spent a good portion of my life down here in the Southwest and just ranged all over the, the states of the Southwest and decided to do uh, this dedicated book about the monsters in Nevada just because it's something that you don't really hear much about. It's very different and not a lot of people are aware that, uh, yeah, there's, there's cryptids in Nevada. <laughs> So what kind of cryptids are they? What are, what are they? What are they? What kind of cryptids are they? Have you found? So what was really fascinating, you know, Nevada is the driest state. So I was very surprised to find uh, over the years that I investigated there that there are a lot of reports of water monsters. In and of course, uh, the most well known uh, is Tahoe Tessie. And Tessie is a water monster that uh, purportedly dwells in Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is in northern Nevada. It's dry of the line between uh, Nevada and California. Sleeping Lake. And there are reports that go back a long, long way to the American places in the region. Uh, and there are reports of this creature that sort of resembles a Loch Ness monster type of, of creature that has been spotted in Lake Tahoe. And it's still Still, uh, accounts crop up. Uh, people have seen this long serpentine body swimming through the water like, around Lake Tahoe. Uh, there's also, wow, there's a whole range of them. There's a lake called Walker Lake that only has a serpent in it. Uh, again, that goes back to the Native American tradition. And then the most fascinating one for me personally is in Pyramid Lake, which uh, is also in northern Nevada. It's on the Paiute Reservation. And the legend there is about a creature called the Water Babies. And these are some pretty creepy tales. Uh, it goes back to Paiute tradition and uh, Paiute culture in the original story uh, about a, a young boy who took a trip to California. And when he was there, he met a woman who, quote, came out of the water. 
like each other has his bride and brought her back to the tribal lands in Nevada. And because she was so different, the tribal elders rejected her. And they told him to take her back to her, back to her land and, and to be rid of her. Now, she wasn't too happy about this. So the story is that she laid a curse on the land and on the land itself. And since that time, there have been all of these strange reports of these creatures who dwell in the land. Now, over the years, variations of the story have popped up. Uh, there were tales during early Western settlements that claimed that the water babies were actually the spirits of the land. Deformed babies who had been thrown into the lake because the parents didn't want them. Uh, you know, there's there's a few stories of a serpent-like creature in, in the lake. But what is really fascinating is that a lot of people go to Pyramid Lake and they report hearing what sounds like a baby's cry or scream coming from the lake. And there are a lot of deaths that occur in Pyramid Lake. You know, it's, it's a very iconic place. It's been a lot of movies. Hollywood was fascinated by it because in, in the middle of the lake is a, a rock pyramid structure that was actually formed, uh, hence the name Pyramid Lake. But uh, these water baby stories are, are really, uh, they're, they're kind of crazy. You hear accounts of people, you know, out boating on the lake. We see strange things in the water. There are natural dangers there, too, because the lake has a, a very severe drop-off. It's, you know, you way out into this lake, and it's a few feet, and all of a sudden it drops down. I think it's uh, about 350 feet. Uh, very so it, it is, you know, it does have some dangers. And it's, it's such a, a stark place in some way. The landscape is, is almost really... Uh, but at the same time, it has a unique kind of beauty, and of course, with all the cryptid mysteries there, uh, 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 you can't help but be fascinated by it. That's crazy. Well, David, thank you so much for taking your time. We really appreciate I really appreciate you. I could wait. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on and opening up, you know, some information for people that are maybe not, not you know, not used to or not even thinking about their uh, people or, or things that are super strange phenomena that really do exist and so uh yes how can people get a hold of you and i know you have uh, you have 30 plus years experience you've been on tv you're you're lecturing around the world and i know you're in high demand so i want to thank you so much for taking the time to come out on my radio show uh, you're quite welcome and i'm going to show my age and say that uh, we haven't talked in a long time but at this point it's over 40 years now and I started exploring this stuff in the 70s and uh, haven't looked back since then, pretty much. So, you know, the books are all on Amazon. Uh, just can type in my name at Amazon.com. You know, find there's an author page on there with bio and uh, some other links. And, of course, all the books are available on there. Lots of new projects coming out for me this year. So, uh, yeah, find me on all the social media, on Instagram, and Facebook, and all those things. Uh, so, yeah, I hope you guys will check me out. All right, take care. Thanks a lot, David. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> All right. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. And David Beverly is just very well renowned, just a beautiful soul. And I'm glad that he's been able to spend the time on our show. So, uh, thank you. And I just want to thank each and everybody for listening. Take care. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Peace, everybody. The portal has closed for this week, but will reopen next Saturday when psychic medium Sherry returns with a new guest and another step in the journey of mind, body, and spirit. If you would like to find out more about Sherry or book a reading, you can do it on Facebook. Just look up psychic medium Sherry or at tinyurl.com slash Sherry Webb. Thanks for tuning in. And we will see you again next week.